Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Great pleasure to be back here. It's already getting dark outside, so it's very good to think about the future. So um, it's, the future is really an interesting topic, I think, because the future is getting faster every day. You know, 10 years ago, I talked about the future, and we talked about things that are far away. Today, we talk about the future, and boom, it's here next week. Remember, we used to talk about what cars can do five or six years ago, you know, electric cars, self-driving cars, and all of a sudden today, like, everybody's acting like there's only self-driving cars and autonomous cars in our future. In fact, many companies like Toyota are now saying they will stop making cars with gas engines in 15 years. And the oil industry, is it one of those same things? We talked about global warming and environmental concerns for 50 years, but all of a sudden it's clear we have more oil and gas than we could ever actually use somewhere but it's going to be too expensive to use it. Now we have solar energy has become 97% cheaper in 10 years. This means actually if it goes on like this, which there's no reason to believe it will not, roughly in 20 years we can get the entire planet covered with energy, abundant energy, from solar, right? from renewable. We're talking about $35 trillion worth of loss for the oil companies. It's a tiny problem, right? And also, of course, the end of wars about oil. Right? You know how many wars there were about oil? I mean, the whole purpose of the Middle East will be deflated right, without oil. <laughs> Maybe they'll have golf courses instead. I, but So, in many ways, I think it's a very good title, Good Enough is Dead. You know, in my, in my own work as, as a futurist, I've been doing this for 15 years, I've come to the conclusion also for myself that good enough is dead. It's not good enough for me to actually know a lot of things. All of you can know the same thing. If you take two weeks off and you just do some work on Google, <laughs> you can figure out what the future brings in the next five years. It's not that difficult. Because information is, a, is ubiquitous now. In fact, the other day I uh, talked to a very large machine at one of the leading providers of artificial intelligence. I'll talk more about that shortly. And I asked the machine about the future of Europe. Okay. And she talked to me very nicely, like a person, for 12 minutes, one of the most intelligent talks I've ever heard about the future of Europe. I'm not kidding you. In a real voice. This, of course, is a very top-end machine you know, that most of us couldn't hope to have. But then I asked the machine about a concept. and I'd call that concept the United States of Europe. Well, you'll have a good laugh on this one, right? Anyway, it's a concept. You know what the machine answered? It said, command not understood. Why? Because it's not something that already exists. You'd have to be a little bit creative to think about that. And that's what's happening all around us, right? Good enough is that my work in the future is not going to be about telling you things you don't know. Right? It's me about understanding things that you may not understand. There's a difference. It's a very big difference. So, uh, basically, as a futurist, it's really straightforward what my job is. It's not prediction. There are some futurists, like Alvin Toffler, that could do this very well, and Arthur C. Clarke, and people like that, they were actually like Jimi Hendrix of futurism, so to speak. <laughs> uh, it's a good fit, because I used to be a musician, I'm attempting to be like Jimi Hendrix. But in any case, my main job is to listen. And I think if you take a piece from this, you know, if you learn how to listen to what the future is bringing, your job will be safe in the future. In fact, if you have kids, that's what you got to tell them. Listen to what is happening around you and discover the future. That's how you get to be a, have a saved job, if there is any such thing as a job in the future. That's how you can think about what the world is offering to you. You know, there are so many thousands of new jobs. It's just mind-boggling. Like a drone operator, not the military, but a civil drone operator. There's thousands of jobs, tens of thousands, being hired to, to fly drones, for example, with blood supply in, in Africa jobs that didn't even exist five years ago. And one of the main observations I have on this turf is, of course, the convergence of man and machine, the symbiosis of man and machine. And so if you take this, we all have these devices, right? These are already our external brains. That's your second brain. Right? In fact, for some guys, you know, it's, it's their first brain when you do stuff like Tinder, you know? becomes your extended brain. Right? 
Your phone number is on here, your music is in here, your contacts are in here, your banking is in here, your information is in here. Very soon, pretty much anything is going to be in here. And then you don't actually open it anymore, you just say, hey, book me a ticket to Oslo. And it knows who you are, and this is already happening. So I wrote a book about this called Technology versus Humanity. And if you read the book, every possible question will be answered. No, just kidding. In fact, it has more questions than answers, but <laughs> just came out three weeks ago. There's a website where you can read most of it already, techvshuman.com, uh, tech be as human. And of course, my, my Twitter handle, I think you saw that here is G. Leonhardt. You can ask questions on my Twitter handle. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the book later. But basically what's happening around us today is that technology is enabling the most amazing revolution that we, we've seen for a long time. I like to say the next 20 years will be more different than the past 300 years. And that is because we've reached a point, a pivot point, a takeoff point, where things are actually no longer science fiction. They actually are working. Automatic language translation, that's been tried for a long time. It's finally here. The computers are actually understanding human language. The Google machine is roughly now a, a tiny point beneath human understanding. It's still quite a big point. <laughs> but in the next two years, we're going to be able to, to talk to computers, and they talk to us like a person. They will actually understand us. And then they're actually going to understand images. That's already happening. And then they're going to have quantum processing. Right? So in, in 10 years, we're basically talking to a machine with an IQ of 50,000. Imagine how that will change banking. You need a big IQ for that. So basically, you know, if you're today, financial advice, asset management, that's people knowing stuff that you don't, allegedly. Well, supposedly. Okay. But these are just facts, right? I mean, what financial advisor can real-time monitor all the markets 24-7 a day is impossible. A machine can do that for us. So we're looking at a world that is going to be so vastly, dramatically different, and here's all the good things that it does. And I like to say it's 90% positive. I mean, look at this long list. Defeating diseases. We can probably end cancer. We can fight really serious issues like diabetes using technology. We can solve the energy problem. We can have abundant fresh water. Many things that we can solve with technology, which I'll talk about, like terrorism, right? Obviously, there's no app for terrorism. Well, to fix terrorism. Um, we can enable the disabled. I mean, today, if you're quadriplegic, you can't walk, you can't do anything, you can already buy an exoskeleton suit, cost two million euros in five years of training, but you can walk again using your brain power. In a few years, maybe that's possible for anybody people who can't actually use their hands to communicate. So all these things are very positive, but they come with a price, right? They come with a price of saying, well, what else does it do? 10% right? worrisome. Total loss of privacy, addiction, dependency, application. Right? All the things that are kind of minor now, but they're, you know, on the right here, dehumanizing. All kinds of things that we're looking at. Of course, unemployment is one of those biggest factors. It is a certainty that technology will replace every single routine job in the world. In the US, they say, basically, if you can describe your work, you will be replaced by a machine. Any routine that we do, machines will eventually learn. And there's only one cutoff point, roughly in 10 years, a point called the singularity which is roughly the point when machines have the processing power than the human brain, of the human brain. That's roughly 40 quadrillion calculations per second is what our measly brains can currently do. Okay. And that is still vastly superior than most computers. And this is just calculations. It's not actually things like emotions or you know, consciousness or whatever. <laughs> Don't even go there. <laughs> But in 10 years, we'll have machines like this very machine will have the capacity of my brain. In 2050, we'll have one machine have the capacity of all human brains. 10 billion brains. So there's no, not a chance we're going to get to keep those routine jobs because they are complicated, like procurement, for example, right? Or risk compliance, you know, those convoluted areas that we're currently still working on. That's not... That's doable. Right? 
I mean, a computer can today say, well, you're going to buy a cheap ticket for me using an intelligent assistant. You know, that's not really rocket science, but all these things will happen in the future. So unemployment is a certainty there. And then we'll have to figure out what are the new jobs, what do our kids have to learn, do we need a social, new social system? I mean, when 65% of people are unemployed, then we don't have capitalism, right? What are they going to do to buy anything with? So in this curve, this is actually good news. I'll explain to you later why. <laughs> I'll say it's bad news, but in this curve, right, this is the exponential curve. This is something we have to get used to. I've only really been understanding this for the last three years. It's a great book called Exponential Organization. My friend Yuri uh, von Geist, who wrote this uh, great book talking about how this works. And basically what's happening is that technology is doubling Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, you know about all that stuff, every 18 months in power. But here's the interesting part. We, we used to be, when I first got going on the internet, we're at the beginning of this curve, right? We're at this place to where, you know, we're only here and it's 0.01 doubles to 0.02 is still nothing. Right? Nothing to worry about. Not much change. Right? But now we're here. Right? We're at the takeoff point. We're at four, and the next point is eight, 16. So in roughly 70 years, we're going to be 128. That's 30 times as far as today. So the kids of my kids will never know how to drive a car themselves. They're going to speak to the car and just does it. They won't know what a CD is or a book. They may not ever learn languages. They may live, or it's certain they will live to be 100, in average. So exponential changes, and that impacts, of course, all the things that we do in business, but we have to learn how to let go of the linear thinking. Because linear thinking is certain to have catastrophic results in business. In other words, you're assuming what you do today will in some way or the other also work tomorrow. Well, that used to be true. When I was in the music business, the assumption was, we're going to sell records, units, whatever they are, downloads. And that's how we make money. We make money distributing those round things or downloads. Turns out, not true. The future is not about distribution, it is about attention. 21 million songs on Spotify for 9 euros a month. One CD, 25 euros. If you're in the distribution business, you're dead, you're just toast. I mean, on, on that note, nobody will know who Sony Music is in five years, if they go on like this. Because that's all they used to do. If you're a bank or insurance company, if you don't follow the exponential path to a new business model, other people will come and just eat at you from 50 different directions. Look at the car industry. What is the biggest mantra of the car business today? Right? Don't buy a car, buy mobility. Kids are not getting driving licenses. California is thinking about a driving license just for autonomous cars. A car can be a legal entity now very soon in California. The car can be a person and buy insurance. I mean, this is all exponential stuff that we have to think about. If you look at all this compilation here, that if you showed this to an uninitiated person, they'd have a heart attack. It's like a hundred things happening at the same time. Not only is our future exponential, it's also combinatorial, which means the trends are amplifying each other. And things become possible because the trends coming together. The Internet of Things, which connects traffic lights and sensor networks and, and wristwatches and stuff, is making things possible like logistics in a completely different way. Smart city, smart farming, all of those things. So basically, you put this in a blender, like a cocktail blender, and you hit the button, and out comes complete reinvention. And if you're in business, you sort of have to say, well, it's mission critical for me to have foresight. Foresight has to do with imagination, as you can imagine. Foresight means that you would actually be able to say, what will you be in five years? Every company on the planet has to think about this. Doesn't matter how big. One of the biggest companies in the world that we just started working with was, is Walmart, you know, the, the retailer. Two and a half million employees. And they're saying some very interesting thing about the future that does not sound like Walmart at all. 
So you, you see in this complete reset, this is really mission critical to think about where this is going and how we're going to get there. And so now on this exponential curve, you also have a new question. You know, when you talk about technology, we used to say just 10 years ago, is it possible that we can make the cloud secure or we can use CRM or ERP software in such a way or so? Whatever the answer is, it's always yes. I mean, today there's almost no question left whether technology can or cannot do something. The answer is always yes. Just why, when? Can technology defeat cancer? Yes, that is definitely going to happen. How exactly, we don't know. It's, but it's not 50 years away. It's more like 20 or 30 years away. So the question is no longer how or if, but why? And if you are using technology for your business, that is the question. The question is not how are we going to build a better mousetrap or be more efficient, but the question is why? What is the human purpose of this technology? So, the news really is here that technology is not going to save us if we have a bad business idea or a bad business model. In fact, the opposite is true because technology is sort of an equalizer also. Many people I talk to, they want to use technology to be more efficient. Most large companies in the world are looking for number one thing is to fire as many people as possible using technology. Call centers. 54 million people work in call centers. These softwares that understand what we're saying, and they can access a database, you know, that is just about there. 98% unemployment in call centers. They'll keep a few people for the tough cases. So that is a question, why are we doing this? Where are we going with this? Right? Literally everything is connected. I live in Switzerland, so I use some cows. Right? Everything is getting connected. This is phenomenal and also very scary. The fact that we're connecting the cows, we can tell, for example, how much they've walked and if they are really organic and so on and so on. Right? That's a probably a good thing, and we can connect the environmental net uh, sensor network. The street lights are being connected. But on the other hand, all the information is being collected, and, and we have no idea who's in charge. The cows don't care. They're going to end up being a hamburger anyway. But what about us? How much control? I mean, right now, 95% of the global data that we produce is controlled in Silicon Valley. And it's controlled under US law, which is emergency law, if you may remember, after September 11th. Right? Anything can be done. We have no control over that. And many of my clients are those that are doing this, so I kind of have an inherent discussion with them about this. So we need to figure out how we can actually go forward in a world that's never offline. Some of us may be the last generation of people that know what offline actually means. Right now, to be fair, I mean, Finland is a highly connected place. Offline is a mental state. It's not a technical state. And in Switzerland, I like to say offline is the new luxury. So I came up with a tourism campaign for Switzerland saying, come to Switzerland, be bored. Right? I mean, Technology has made it impossible for us to be bored. That's not a good thing. What do we need boredom for? Well, guess what we need boredom for? To discover other things. Uh, so we're not constantly surrounded by noise. So never offline is not such a good idea, really. And then everything is connected, and of course, everything is being made convenient. Uh, some people talk about the singularity. I'll talk about the sofa-larity, which has us lying on the sofa, remote controlling our entire lives without moving. That becomes entirely possible, right? Becoming superhuman. I mean, this is actually, this is the pitch of technology. Eh? Use our stuff and you have superpower. And you know what? I'm really tempted by this. I love technology. I try out everything. Literally everything. But the bottom line is, if technology doesn't make us better humans, what do we need it for? If the technology you're going to use in your business just makes better algorithms, makes it more efficient, well, congratulations, you save a few dollars, but where is it going? Right? What is the purpose of where you're going with this conversation? As I was saying earlier, this is a, a Google project called GDELT. Uh, you can find out anything. Any job that has to do with information advantage is toast. 
journalism, not, not journalism itself, but that part of journalism, right? research, financial advice. It's no longer about knowledge, it's about understanding how we use that knowledge, right? how we use it just in case pretty much all of that is becoming a bit too. Predictive analytics, you heard about that, of course, in the financial business, widely used. With the data intake of several hundred million data feeds a day, any organization can become pretty predictive. Well, this is already happening on the markets, I'm sure you know. Roughly 47% of all transactions are done by machines. When that reaches 87%, we won't have a stock market, right? It's machines working with machines. So the whole system kind of collapses then. We have to think about what that means for us. Where is it going? What could be the next possible steps? Here's a great example. There's been a trial in the US that said, what if we compare judges and machines? And so the case would be that you would have a criminal, he would decide that criminal can go back on the street and maybe he will, he'll come around, right, or not, based on facts. The judge decides. This trial showed the judge had worse judgment than the machine. The, the machine made better decisions suggested by algorithm about who should go back on the street or not. Well, allegedly, okay? So the question I have for you, who do you believe, man or machine? Where does this go? You know what the next proposal is. Right? Artificial intelligent politicians. Right? Well, that's only an upgrade, I suppose, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk more about that. But I mean, in business, you have to wonder about this. Right? When, you have, when you do business and you're using data, how real is it? And how do you decide? I mean, this is a, what I call the TripAdvisor effect. Right? You guys use TripAdvisor? Okay. Sometimes you have to say, it's, you know, it's pretty amazing and it's pretty accurate, and sometimes it's just so totally damn wrong. It's just completely nuts. Right? And this is because you don't know what happened with TripAdvisor and what the exact composition of that output is. Right? It could be heaven, it could be hell, you don't know. You can, I mean, if you're just going to go eat what TripAdvisor tells you, you are in deep trouble. Right? On the other hand, if you already made your picture somewhere else, TripAdvisor can complement it. But, you know, why would you stand in front of an empty restaurant where there's absolutely nobody while all the other places are packed and it says in TripAdvisor, this is the best place you can go to, but it's completely empty, right? Why would you go inside if everybody else goes somewhere else just because the machine tells you? That's what we do. Right? That's called automation bias. That's because that's who we are. We like, th we like shortcuts. As a musician, I spent my 10,000 hours working as a musician, learning how to play an instrument. Let's just shortcut that and buy an iPad with an app, and I can reach the same place in 10 hours. Right? Is that the way the future is going to be? I don't think so. So let's talk about uh, this. Uh, IBM has some really great projects here. It's one of my clients, but I'm not showing that for that reason. It's kind of entertaining. Check out what uh, Sheila Baer said. She was the head of the FTC in the US. Sheila Baer, former FDIC chairperson, under two presidents. That's me. I have studied your writings on finance. Oh, you read my book. Yes, I am learning about risk. Well, risk is necessary, Watson. It's the only way businesses grow. We just have to manage and understand it. I can analyze complex data to help people evaluate risk and make better decisions. That's great, because you know, this isn't just theory. This protects real people and real lives. That is a real good point. Sheila Baer. Yeah, so interesting, you know, that uh, IBM is suggesting that we could use a machine to do these things. In fact, the CEO of IBM the other day, Ginny Rometty, said in the future, it won't be experts, people deciding, it'll be analytics and data. And I think she was quite serious about this. So where does this go? I mean, how are we going to value this and which direction will we take this? I mean, this is going to be... Really, really interesting discussion. Going back to the title of the, com of the uh, presentation, this is sort of a Darwinistic thing that we're seeing. I call this digital Darwinism. What used to be good enough no longer is. Airbnb now is much better than many hotels. Right? It's providing an experience. You could argue that, of course, but Airbnb is liquid. It works. Netflix, I mean, Netflix is, you have Netflix here, right? Is exploding, killing regular over-the-top television. 
Uh, you have this, what's happening in New York, less people taking taxis, more people taking Ubers. And as soon as something comes up that's just really good, that actually works, it's completely over. And so basically, good enough is dead. Look at banking. Every major bank in the world has an initiative, what's called robo-advisor. These are robotic systems, software agents, that can advise customers because now, remember, computers can speak and they can understand what I'm saying. So that makes them pretty much like a person, backed up by a hundred billion data feeds. IBM just bought a company in New York, a thousand people who are risk and compliance analysts. And the only reason that IBM bought this company is to feed their heads into the machine, literally. All those guys are going to sit down and say, this is how I do my job. I'm going to do if this, then that, you know, that sort of thing. And the machine will learn it, make a model out of it. I guarantee you these robo-advisors will do a better job than most financial advisors ever have. On, a, on the low risk level, you know, on obvious paradigms like investing 10,000 euros in, you know, low environment, low risk environment. And then the blockchain. This is a revolution that's almost like the second internet now. The possibility of a cryptographic peer-to-peer -peer network that transacts contracts and money and all these things at 99.9% .9 cheaper. I mean, this is the key topic, of course, for banking. And B2B is next. This is not just about the consumer space. So, Marshall McLuhan once said that with new technologies, it's the framework that changes, not the picture. So when you think about what you're doing in, in your work and what your company is doing, let's think about the framework. The larger story. Procurement is a great example. What is the story of procurement? Buying stuff for your company. Okay. Most of that stuff is going to be about facts and figures and matching and, you know, it's intricate, but what is the feature of procurement? Probably an algorithm on some level. So when we think about this, all of a sudden we're realizing that you know, we have stuff like artificial intelligence, robotics, the fourth industrial revolution. These things are all extremely powerful. And basically I'm saying it's 90% opportunity, but we'll have to understand where the opportunity lies, especially for Finland, a yeah. small country like Switzerland where I live. I think a little bit bigger than Switzerland. So what does it mean? You know, how can we use this on a global level? Where do we go from here in this millennial generation that's never offline? You know, 75% of the workforce around the globe will be kids you know, who are now 25. They'll be the new CEOs. You know, they're going to decide stuff that, that you would never think that we would decide. I mean, if a 25-year-old kid ever moves out from, from the house, yeah, most of them actually stay, if they do ever move out, they will not subscribe to cable television. Yeah? They'll get the internet. They're not looking for a career job, they're looking for fulfillment. It's a completely different life. So, in this direction, we're basically going to see what I call the mega shifts. It's a big part of my book. Um, the 10 mega shifts. So the 10 mega shifts are something you dive into. I will not go through all of them because we'll be here tomorrow morning if I do. But um, there's a new site I'm working on. It's called megashifts.com. You can poke around there. But basically, those are the, the trends that will change our society on a much larger level than just what is called digital transformation. Uh, in fact, when you hear about digital transformation, just put that somewhere in a drawer. That's like social media. Right? That's like a concoction of meanings. Nobody knows what that actually means. <laughs> but you take on all those trends, you put them together. Let's start with one, datafication. Okay. The other day, I bought my first connected hiking boot. Okay. This is a, I mean, I usually wouldn't do those kind of things because I think it's kind of annoying, but I tried it anyway. And what the boot does, it connects to my phone, right, collects all the data, and it says, you've walked 43 miles, and I can tell you your left foot is dragging more than your right foot. Right? That's interesting information. And that's why I'm not doing so well. I get a blister or something. Or it says, you're going to need new shoelaces in 40 kilometers. So all that data that didn't used to exist because I had to go look at the shoes to figure it out, right? that's now becoming data. When your doctor 10 years ago sees you, it would scribble stuff down, put it in a file. That never turned into data. Today, every single bit of information is turning into data that can be tracked, 
put somewhere connected right? datafication. And that is also a heaven or hell, because right? it can create all kinds of interesting scenarios. Automation, of course, that's quite clear. We'll talk more about the augmentation. We're becoming augmented people. The mobile phone is kind of an augmentation, but that is very trivial, it's outside of us. But very soon, augmented reality, virtual reality holograms are going to be mainstream as uh, like WhatsApp. So when you're a doctor or policeman, you wear a holographic visor and you can see the world like um, Tom Cruise did in Minority Report. You go inside the data and take it out and create large contexts. So that is going to result in a world that is dramatically different like the world of the autonomous car. I mean, if you put all these trends together, automation, platformization, virtualization, robots, data, personalization, you get these kind of products. Vastly different kinds of products. So these mega shifts are really important to understand because they kind of point in this direction. So if you want to read about the blockchain some more, which I just omitted, you have to read my colleague's book, uh, Don Tapscott, Blockchain Revolution. If you can make it through the whole book, then you'll know enough. <laughs> it's really a deep piece, right? And, and banking is now impacted by all of those things that are on this list. So let's talk about disruption a little bit more. That's actually a good, a good relation to this. Uh, if you're looking at this chart, uh, just look at your own company or your own life and say, which ones of those four things attribute to my company? And then you know what your fate is in terms of how you're going to deal with disruption. Right. Let's say you're a banker. Right. Complex environment, tick. Trust issues, big tick. Obsolete intermediaries, huge tick. Right. Restricted access, regulation, tick. Four of those things are applicable to banking. How many of those would be applicable to energy? Complex environments, trust issues, yeah, a little bit. Intermediaries, a little bit, there's a little bit early for that. Restricted access, yes. So that's a good way to analyze so if you're ripe for disruption. And I like to call disruption sometimes a Tesla moment. You know, years ago, we did a seminar for a big German car company. It was six or seven years ago. And we talked about self-driving cars, autonomous cars, car sharing. And we had a room of 20 or 30 people. And we basically got laughter. We got flat out laughter about the concept of sharing a car. The idea of having a car does not have a great sound when you step on the gas. The Tesla moment is when you realize that the other guys weren't full of shit. All of a sudden you realize, you know, this could actually work. Tesla moment in journalism, we realize that people love paper, but you know, there's, there's a possibility of paper not necessarily being in the future. Now we realize, of course, entirely new business models coming up. The Tesla moment in the music business, and I found out they sued 258,000 people when they went to court against 258,000 people, and they realized it didn't do a thing for their business. Right? All the money went to the lawyers, and they lost 71% in revenues in 12 years. So, if you're facing a Tesla moment, you have to think about this. I mean, look at what Tesla is doing. Tesla is currently selling twice as many luxury cars as Mercedes and BMW combined in most Western countries, where they are. I have no real idea why, because it's even hard to get one now. <laughs> but. So, that's partly based on this tidal shift in computing. And this tidal shift is really what we have to understand now. Computers are now going from the tabulating era to the programming era, to the cognitive era. This is important to understand because uh, a program computer does a job, a cognitive computer actually invents the job. Well, this is IBM's headline, you know, cognitive computing, but let's talk about cognitive as a separate thing. Cognitive as thinking, right? I mean, we tried this years ago, thinking machines, right? This was from the 50s. Today, the number one objective of CXOs in the banking, financial services sector is cognitive computing, followed by insurance, media, and so on. It's computers that can make up rules and define the process. Logistics, for example, estimation is that if we had computers figure out how to do logistics, that's trillions of interactions, we could save between 50 and 60% of cost of logistics. This is a mind-boggling number. 
including, of course, some of them would be printed rather than shipped. Now we have computers that are totally capable of that, quantum computers. The biggest one is in China, of course. But by around 2020, estimates are saying that we will have artificially intelligent computers that can learn markets and can learn our bodies also. What will we do with this enormous power? This is like the power of nuclear energy. It can be terrible, most of the time it is, <laughs> or can be used for energy. So we're going to need some pretty wise politicians. You know? We're going to need some people who really understand this, otherwise we're in deep trouble. Because this is tremendous power of technology. We can reinvent how we do things, or we can blow ourselves up in the process. And this is a huge premise, learning machines. I mean, simple learning machines already you use every day, like Google Maps. Google Maps knows who you are, where you are. The average Google user has 25 million records on Google. 25 million. You don't even want to know how many records Facebook has about you. That's a lot more than that. So this machine is already learning about you, and, and Google knows that you've been there, you've been here, you've stayed there longer. Just like Amazon knows when you read the Kindle, how fast you read, what time you read, how many times you skip, whether you've shared it, what time you open, how big your battery is, and so on. Right? They know all these things. And they learn from it. So that's a huge premise, and it's basically the idea of saying that computers can do this. And you've heard about the singularity, the point in time, roughly 10 years, that may be optimistic, when computers have the same capacity than us. And 2050, where we may be entering a post-human era. Now, this is a kind of a strange conversation to have. We'll go back to that in a second, but suffice to say this, now we have to think about what I call digital ethics. Huh? How good is technology? How powerful is it? Who is in charge? And what do we intend to do with it? This is a big conversation because it has to do with lots and lots of things that are really important. This is a page from, from uh, Time magazine. A bunch of people have proposed that the next president of the US should be an artificial intelligence. I think that's probably a good alternative to the current choices. <laughs> right? Even though I have to say, I, I do hope that we don't get Trump. He's already an AI, but a badly programmed one. As a <laughs> so, I mean, this is a uh, joke aside. You know, basically, the convergence of man and machine is years away, not decades. If you're my age, you're going to see that. You, know, you can't retire before that happens, sorry. It's years away. And I would maintain that is really 90% positive. Imagine all the things that we can do if we do this right. When you think about man and machine, don't think about Hollywood. This is complete fear-mongering. Don't think about Black Mirror or Ex Machina or, you know, there's only two good movies, that's Blade Runner and Her that somewhat get it right. The rest is just all fear. You cannot proceed into the future based on fear. You'll never do anything. You just, you know. The biggest problem about machines is not that machines will kill us, but that we become too much like machines. We know what it means to become like a machine when you see a family sitting around the dinner table and everybody's working on their external brains. Right? That's, we have already become machines. How will we adapt? What's the social contract? What is the, the consequence of this? Right? In this world, data is the new oil. And you've seen this chart that has been widely spread. Ten years ago, the most powerful companies on the planet were oil companies and banks. Today, look at the list of companies. Alphabet is Google, of course. The most powerful companies in the world are tech companies. Data companies, data mining companies. Platforms. And so the question really is what will we do ultimately? Should they be regulated like we regulated oil? Probably. I mean, their power is tremendous. They're playing on a tilted playing field. Technology companies don't play on the same playing field than, you know, uh, Mercedes Benz. They start from zero. When YouTube started, it was basically illegal to upload videos. They found an exemption under the DMCA. Okay, that's pretty clever, but 
you know, it wasn't entirely legal, and they started on the playing field of saying, well, the worst case is we all go to jail for copyright infringement. You can't do that when you're a major newspaper. So these companies are starting on a playing field, and it's powered by artificial intelligence, by data analytics, by all these things. And the CEO of Google says, famously, Sundar, we're going from mobile first to AI first. I mean, this is a company that makes $2.8 billion a month with advertising where we type some two-word phrases into a search engine. And that's like Stone Age, basically. Now they're going to artificial intelligence. In fact, Google is building a global brain. Right? Everything we have in there, in the sky, connected. Right? This could be Skynet, if the worst case, or it could be Nirvana, because it would open up all kinds of things, including research. Right? There's 8,550 oncology reports every single day and case studies on cancer. Which doctor can look at all that stuff? And it's impossible. Right? Can we have a machine that does that? That would be fantastic. Right? The intelligence, the super intelligence of that. So those are the biggest game changers, period, in our lives. And they will change everything to the good or the bad that we have to think about. How do we actually create this? You know, machines that can talk to us from apps to global brains to digital assistants and that do all these things. Here's an example. This is a very complex question. I asked the other day of an app called Viv which is, was just purchased by Samsung. Very complex question, and this uh, digital assistant goes out and gets my ticket in 14 seconds. Right. Imagine you can ask this assistant and say, you know, I have a slight problem with the social security system in, health in, in Finland. Can you run this 1.4 trillion records and come back to me tomorrow with a fix? Right. Well, that's a little bit far away today, but that's not too far away. Because now we have voice control speaking to machines. Here's a quick example. So, how much money do you have? Alexa, stop. And Reno, you definitely have to stop. How you do that? It's my Amazon Echo. I can stream music, order things, and watch this. You've heard about the Amazon Echo. This is a box that sits in your living room. Four and a half million Americans have it. That listens to you the entire time. You just say, Alexa, please switch on the light in the bedroom. Play rock and roll in the bathroom. Order some more sticky notes. Well, speaking like a friend. This is already happening today, and the future is uh, quite clear that intelligent machines are here. And uh, my good friend Paul Saffo, a futurist, says uh, that we should be careful not to confuse a clear view with a short distance. Right? Uh, for this to really work perfectly, it's quite a bit away. Uh, Alexa can order my sticky pads. But more complicated things, I think it would need more information for that to actually work. I'll skip this because I want to get to the summary and get some questions. Okay? So, first, I get this all the time. Are we becoming useless humans? This is a serious question. You could argue that we're useless because technology will do everything for us. Including having babies, by the way. That's another project that's being looked at called exogenesis, an external womb. This is not science fiction, even though I think it should be. But so I'll be becoming useless. So the question really is, what do we do in the future if, if, if they can do all that stuff? Well, the answer really is, as, as this guy Albert Hubbard said years ago, one machine can do the work of 50 ordinary men, women. No machine can do the work of one extraordinary man or woman. And how do we become or how do we remain extraordinary? By being human. The exact same skills that weren't allowed in companies in the past, which is emotion, compassion, intuition, imagination, are the ones that are going to be our future. Because all the other hard skills, you know, implementing a plan, figuring stuff out, that's machine work. That is robotic work that we used to do. Work like a robot. So that is going to be our future, is to combine those two things, you know, figure out where are we going with this, what I call the andro rhythms, you know, the human rhythms that we have in ourselves that are enabling us to do these things. So the bottom line is whatever can be digitized and automated will be, and that's a certainty. Just like music is in the cloud, it's not on plastic. Okay? And the future of the car does not contain 
fumes coming out the back. Okay. But it's also true that everything that cannot be automated will become very valuable. And that happens to be 95% of what we do. When you're working with customers, you're not basing your relationship on algorithms. Right? This is about trust, meaning, purpose, service, not zeros and ones. And this is a whole different thing that we're doing that computers can't currently do. So the key question really is in your, in your business, what should be automated and what should not be automated? I mean, clearly driving a car is not a human thing that we must have. Right? I'm driving a car out in the country, maybe. Right? But driving a car for transportation in the city, that's not a human requirement. Right? We, could, we can live with automating that. I think you'd agree. Very un-German thing to say. But still. What should we not automate? Well, clearly, finding a partner, deciding life and death, having people killed with automatic drones. There's a couple of trivial things that we should keep to ourselves, to our own decision-making process. right? that we should actually keep, because technology has no ethics. That, that's a fact, and I think that's fine. There are some technology companies that have recently come around to thinking about ethics, and that's good news. If we use lots of technology, then we have to figure out how we put the human inside. Right? That, that's the bottom line. The more technology you use, the more you have to put humans inside, otherwise you end up with a machine. So the more we amp up technology, the more we have to put the humans aside, because machines don't think like humans think. Humans think with the body, not the brain. That's Daniel Kahneman, the famous uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning psychologist, who said, cognition is embodied. We think with the body, not the brain. If I meet you in the hallway, it takes us one second to figure out if we're going to, going to connect, if we're part of the same tribe, or whatever you want to call it, one second, right? without actually saying anything. So that's basically the big difference. Right? The, the danger is really that we would say that machines can do all of the things while they really can't. So our future in business is to say, let's use those machines. Let's replace all the routines. Let them do what has to be done that's just monkey work. Right? Fine. They don't have to think like we think. They should not have ethics. They should not have emotions. They should remain a tool. And I can guarantee you, if you don't use these tools, you will be dead. Your company will be dead in a short time. Right? Because that is the nature of business, and that's what's happening all around us. So let me come to a summary. The CEO of Walmart says something very interesting. As the world becomes more digital, it will be the humanity of Walmart. Now, that's kind of an irony right there. It will be the humanity of Walmart that differentiates us and wins with customers. That's an interesting statement, right? As the world becomes more technology, it's the humanity that makes a difference. I think that's something we can learn something from. So I would recommend to you look in this direction, right? As much as you may believe in technology, hence the chain, right? It's really about experiences about purpose, about putting the human inside. And you can clearly see where this is happening in work. You see this chart here? Totally clear, non-routine cognitive work on the way up. Routine manual work, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, artists, on the way up, everything else down. Don't let your kids learn a routine job. Whether it's a programmer or a banker on the low level, whatever it is, accountant, bookkeepers, oh my God, yeah, just... <laughs> so let me summarize, okay? Exponential change is certain. This is a positive force in our life that we have to embrace. We have to understand. I think the best way to prove that you're future ready is to understand this. Thinking machines and artificial intelligence is a certainty. That's as certain as Spotify, music moving into the cloud, cars going electric. The mega shifts, the end of routine. I made a list the other day saying, these are all my routine jobs. And now I'm taking one after the other off the list and trying to automate, use a machine for that. Because that's going to happen. Routine jobs will be going that direction. Developing foresights. A foresight a week, that's all I ask. 
Just one idea about your future. And finally, digital ethics. What are the guidelines for our life in a machine age, in a digital age? Every single politician, official, CEO, any leader has to answer that question all the time, how we do this in the future. So I want to leave you with the uh, bottom line realization that I have a lot when I'm speaking to people is the less we assume about what we are and what we can do, the more we can discover. So assume less, discover more is a very good way of looking at this and saying, well, what if? What if? Let's imagine this would be different. Alvin Toffler said, in dealing with the future, it is far more important to be imaginative than to be right. Also a very un-German thing to say. This is our future. Let's imagine what it looks like, and then we'll get it right. Thanks very much for listening.